Hi, fifth grade. It's Miss Mills. I'm going to be reading Team Moon, How 400,000 People Landed Apollo 11 on the Moon. This was written by Catherine Thimish, and we will be reading the first part of this book today. Here is a picture. I really like this because it shows the trajectory of Apollo 11 and how it um, went around the from the Earth to the moon and back. It says, The Dream, the flight path of Apollo 11 to the moon and home again, and the challenge. Beyond Imagination, it was mind-boggling. The television itself had been a flat-out miracle when it began to dominate the scene a mere 20 years previous, and now that technological wonder of wonders was going to trump itself, because very soon, if all went according to plan, it would transmit pictures of an actual man on the actual moon. In 1969, on July 20th, in one part of the world, and July 21st, in the other part, Half a billion people on the blue marbled globe clicked on their TV sets, flush with ex anticipation, eager to watch as Apollo 11 would attempt to put man on the moon for the first time in all of history. The moon. Um, this is the caption that explained the picture before. A uh, crowd of workers... Uh, at the company that built the lunar module sque squeezed together in plant three in New York to witness the launch. And now, at this defining moment, the world has come together like nothing ever before, not only to wish the astronauts Godspeed, but to bear personal witness to this incredible event. On that day, people gathered in homes and in schools and businesses, in restaurants and shops, and on sidewalks and streets and in parks. They were eager to be part of however small they were eager to be a part, however small, of something so out of this world big. If there was a TV in the vicinity, it was on, and people sat and watched, wide eyed, waiting. Fate has a ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. And this picture shows thousands of New Yorkers at a moon inn at Central Park's Sheep Meadow watching the, the, the live cast. Rest in peace on the moon? Thankfully, no. Those ominous words, penned in top secret for President Nixon, were never spoken. But while millions upon millions of people were spellbound and starry-eyed with moon mania, still sitting, waiting, those people behind the scenes fretted over more problems and concerns and plans for emergencies than the rest of the world could ever know. The fate has ordained speech was to be delivered at the end that was the worst possible scenario came, came to pass. If the, if the world's possible scenario came to pass, the speech's very existence proved that beneath all the excitement, those people running the show never for a moment lost sight of the all too real dangers they were choosing to run into head on. And though millions of eyes were focused front and center on the astronauts and the spacecraft, much of the action would, in fact, be taking place on the sidelines. When those millions of people tuned in hoping to witness the moonwalk, one thing they wouldn't see, or at best might just catch a glimpse of, were the non-astronauts, those beyond the glare of the lime limelight. I'm going to stop here and look at this picture and read the caption. A small television and an outdoor sidewalk cafe in Milan, Italy, draws a large crowd of spectators for the monument mo momentous landing. It didn't matter that Neil and Buzz were Americans. They were mankind's represent representatives. They were men from planet Earth. So said the plaque that they would leave on the moon. The regular folks whose efforts made an import impossible mission possible in the first place. All the people behind the scenes whose ideas and expertise, imagination, 
and inventiveness, dedication and focus, labor and skill combined in one great endeavor on the grandest of grand scales and conspired to put man on the moon. Yes, three heroic men went to the moon, but it was a team of 400,000 people that put them there. There were the flight directors, controllers, planners, and engineers, the rocket designers and builders and technicians, the managers, supervisors, quality control and safety inspectors, the programmers, electricians, welders, seamstresses, gluers, painters, doctors, geologists, scientists, trainers, and navigators. Apollo 11 is their story, too. It says, in the firing room, members of the launch team view the liftoff after uh, Apollo 11 has cleared the tower and is on its way to the moon. This picture shows astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin in the hatchway of the command module during a testing session. And these are some quotes. All this is possible only through the blood, sweat, and tears of a number of people. All you see are the three of us, but beneath the surface are thousands and thousands of others. Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins. I think one of the things we had was a common goal, and we all realized that we were into something that was one of the few things in history that was going to stand out over the years. We're going to go to the moon. We're putting a man on the moon. And that so captured our imagination and our emotion that we didn't want to go home that night. We just wanted to keep going, and we couldn't wait to get up and get back to work in the, ne- in the morning because we're going to the moon. This was said by Charlie Mars, the NASA Chief Luna, Lunar Module Project Engineer at Kennedy Space Center. <clears throat> in the beginning, they were going to the moon all right. At least that was the plan. That was the dream and the challenge set forth by one man, President John F. Kennedy, when he declared in May of 1961 I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to earth. So they came by the thousands, kids really, 20 somethings, a few in their thirties. No one knew for sure how to get to the moon, how to land or get home, but their goal was clear cut and that was enough. That gave them purpose, a reason to puzzle out the problems and seek solutions rather than sleep. Kennedy's decision was triggered by an intense space race with the old Soviet Union. The Soviets were first in space with Sputnik, first two with a man in space. But for those who actually worked on the moonshot, the the race became an afterthought. They were fueled instead by a desire to explore the heavens, the poetry of it all, the scientific challenge of it all, the we're going to the moon excitement of it all. But the moon? Could it really be done? Right from the get-go, administrators had identified 10,000 individual tasks that would have, been, would have to be completed, and that was the, only the beginning. So much to do. Too much? An aide to Kennedy quietly predicted that it would take 44 attempts, 44 tries before ever landing once on the great gray rock in the sky. Moving forward, the final picture was altogether different from the dream. Most thought they'd be going straight to the moon with one spacecraft, land, and come straight back. Instead, as the plan evolved, it called for two very different craft, a command and service module for flight and and a lunar module to land on the surface. No one ever imagined landing on the moon in a seatless, gold foil encased, four-legged, Spiderish, spiderish thingamajig named the Lem. After all, no one knew what a lunar module was even supposed to look like, and so form followed function. Never mind if it looked like a bug. I can't say that I'm aware of any program where more people understood what the schedule was, how important it was, and worked so hard to make it happen. We had a great team, recalled Joe Gavin, vice president of the of the Grumman. Aerospace Corporation contractor for the lunar module. That team at Grumman was 7,500 workers strong. They designed, developed, and built the lunar module, christened Eagle for Apollo 11 from the ground up. 
Reliability was insisted upon. They had a motto, there is no such thing as a random failure, and failures were eliminated one by one because it was their baby, their handiwork, eight years of their lives that very soon would settle down, fingers crossed, on that giant glowing ball in the inky black soup of space. This caption reads, the lunar module, or LM, (coughs) pronounced LEM, she was LM5, but the crew named her Eagle. The LM was mainly designed and built by NASA's prime contractor, the Grumman Aerospace Corporation. The LEM is now 23 feet high and 31 feet across the extended landing gear pads. Its total earth weight, fully loaded with crew and propellants, is 32,200 pounds. And onward. Space. It's dangerous out there. Micro, meteoroids, radiation, airlessness. And coming home would be no picnic either. The compact car-sized space capsule would be greeted and surrounded by searing white-hot flames as it slammed madly back down to Earth. In designing the command module, the one thing we had to be sure of was that we could keep the crew alive, that it was a big team, a, a big item. And that was a big item, said Mag uh, Fege, NASA chief engineer and principal designer of the command module. Keeping the crew alive under such extreme conditions was indeed a big item. Only the command module, Columbia, would make the complete journey from Earth to the moon and back home again. It would serve as crew living quarters and as the spacecraft control center, and Columbia alone would confront the fiery Earth re-entry. But the wizards at North American Rockwell, NASA's prime contractor for the command module, were up for the challenge. 14,000 folks there, plus a skilled hodgepodge of 8,000 other companies, toiled to ensure that millions of components of the command module were in top-notch order. Columbia was off to confront danger. Its builders would need to rely on their eight years of efforts to give them the confidence for a successful outcome, but it would be 500,000 miles before the truth of the matter would be told. Could their command module keep the crew alive? And there's a picture of it. It says Command Module 107, along with the Service Module, or CSM, was built primarily by North America. Named Columbia by the crew, the Command Module was crafted with more than 2 million parts, nearly 15 miles of wire, a control panel with 24 instruments, 566 switches, 40 indicators, and 71 lights. And upward. Launch operators at Kennedy Space Center in Florida was like its own little town, a whopping 17,000 engineers, technicians, uh, mechanics, contractors, and managers were needed to pull together the Apollo 11 launch, needed to check, check, check the spacecraft, test it, stack the three rocket stages in the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, roll it out, recheck it, fuel it, and ready it for liftoff. One of the most critical preparations for launch was the orchestration and performance of of the crucial CDDT. The countdown demonstration test, or CDDT, gives us confidence that we're going to get there in time and everything's going to percolate or work perfectly together, explained Ernie Rise, uh, chief of the pre-flight operations branch for Apollo 11. It's a dress rehearsal for the countdown. The only thing we don't do is we don't load the vehicle with all its fluids and juices, like the rocket fuel. Come launch day, Ernie Rise and about 500 others would work the consoles from the firing room of the Launch Control Center, LCC, the nucleus of launch operations. They would run the controls that would catapult Apollo 11 moonward bound. 5,000 others would directly support them for the actual liftoff. It was a long, long march to that day, and the, and the little town of KSC became a second home to quite a few folks. Many a lunch, dinners, anniversaries, birthdays were forsaken in pursuit of the ready-to-launch. On July 16, 1969, they were indeed ready, and at 9.32 a.m., 
whoosh. And here are pictures of Apollo 11 going during the CDDT, the dress rehearsal for launch. You look out at the blue, dark blue before dawn morning, and it is absolutely magnificent, majestic, says Ernie Rise, the chief of the pre-fly operations branch. The launch of Apollo 11 as viewed from the Air Force plane, Apollo 11 rockets to the moon on the Saturn V launch vehicle made up of three stages. The Saturn V is an intimidating 281 feet. And this is a view from Earth of Earth from orbit. The rocket has put a, Apollo 11 into a circular orbit, orbit 115 nautical miles above Earth. The crew will remain in this parking orbit for one and a half orbits revolutions around the Earth while they check out the spacecraft systems. Midway through the second orbit, the third stage of Saturn V will ignite to send them on a translunar trajectory or to the pathway to the moon. When they arrive at the moon, they will go into lunar orbit, circling and stunning the moon and eating and sleeping for 12 revolutions. On the 13th orbit, the eagle will undock from Columbia and pre prepare for descent. Maiden Voyage, the final 10 miles. And this is a picture of the eagle shortly after undocking from Columbia. Mike Collins is doing a visual inspection of the limb from Columbia, paying particular particular notice to the landing gear that it is down in lock position. The Eagle has wings radioed Neil Armstrong from the lunar module as he and Buzz Aldrin flew 69 miles above the moon. Four words. Slightly cryptic, but oh so lyrical. There was no doubt of their meaning. The lunar module Eagle had separated from the command log module Columbia and was now flying solo. It was ready to descend to the surface of the moon. Magical words, those four. Big smiles back on Earth, back in Houston at Mission, mission Control. In Houston, the white team was at the consoles in the control room, monitoring and facilitating the moon landing. Gene Krantz was the flight director on duty, the person in charge of the mission during that time and responsible for the final decisions. He had arrived at the Mission Control complex, shortly past dawn, accepting the good lucks that were tossed his way by those he passed in the lobby. He refused the elevator, instead climbed three flights of stairs to the MOCR, the Mission Operations Control Room, pronounced MOCR. They were attempting to put man on, on the moon today, a dazzling technological triumph. But at home, Technology had a habit of getting stuck between floors, and flight director Kranz was taking no chances. Today is not the day to get stuck in an elevator, he wrote in his memoir. Forty minutes prior to beginning the landing sequences, Kranz addressed his flight controllers. In the next hour, we will do something that has never been done before. We worked long hours and had some tough times, but we have mastered our work. Now we are going to make this work pay off. You are a great team, one that I feel privileged to lead. Whatever happens, I will stand behind every call that you will make. It was time. As instructed by Mission Control in Houston, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin fired their descent rocket engine, lowering the Eagle to an altitude of just 50,000 feet above the moon's surface. On an earlier mission, several months previous, Apollo 10 had gotten to this very point, 50,000 feet close, but still so far. But now, for the first time, Neil and Buzz would go that last leg, the final 10 miles. You are go for PDI, power descent ignition, mission control radio, the crew. Never had more monumental words been spoken so simply. The green light was given to go ahead and land on the moon. 20 minutes now, and they would be on the surface of the moon, or not. And that's all we're going to read today. Hope that you enjoyed that. And we will talk with you more about um, the text and the text structures.